Ant-Man 3 in 3D. Full title being Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I really loved. This video will have a number of jokes and I will get into several serious topics. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead and so you see me lower my index finger. Please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries, entries in the MCU and as soon as in the review itself, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie and I will be discussing the ending in that part. So... That brings us to the plot. So, yeah, the, the, um, let's see, yeah, yeah, the, the IMDb plot summary is quite good, so I will just use that. Scott Lang and Hope Van Dyne, along with Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne, explore the quantum realm where they interact with strange creatures and embark on an adventure that goes beyond the limits of what they thought was possible. So, the, yes. The 3D is quite good. Uh, you know, it's not on the level of an avatar, but, yeah, you know, it adds depth. There are things that stick out at us, things that fly right at us. I already mentioned that I love this movie. I, I do recommend watching this movie, and if you're going to watch it, I would definitely say it's worth watching at least once in 3D in a theater. You know, this is kind of the... the this is what 3D was made for, you know, the the creatures and locations and some of the things that happen are just so visually like really they they just captivating and and incredibly well done and yeah for for sure you know there's a there's a lot of like the MCU has done 3D pretty much not not for absolutely everything but they did start very early like we have so yeah the the f let's see the first iron man movie and the first er, the first the the hulk movie the mcu hulk movie anyway those were 2008 so that was before you know avatar relaunched the the 3d craze in 2009 i'm not sure any of the mcu movies haven't been 3d since then so, yeah, and a, and a bunch of these, you know, you can tell it's, it doesn't really need to be, but this one I would definitely recommend, 3D. So, the writing, so this was written by Jeff Loveness, and other than this, he, yeah, he, he has written Avengers the King Dynasty, so, you know, they're, they're doing the, um, um, what's it called? It's, it's that thing where he's gonna, he's writing for Kang, you know, movies that are about Kang, and he wrote six episodes of Rick and Morty, which I feel like every person you ask, like, people either really love it or really hate it, I I don't really have an opinion on, I've, I've never watched any Rick and Morty Anyway, um, but I do hear that this has, you know, the, the weirdness of that is, is here. And certainly there are some, there are some very weird things in this that you wouldn't expect, like, not, not necessarily, like, deep and, and really gonna make you, you know, it's not the Matrix, it's not gonna change the way you think about things, but there are some very trippy ideas and visuals and... Yeah, I, you know, if I had no idea that Rick and Morty, well, I, I would have at least have figured maybe there's some inspiration there. 
and and I should say, you know, I I love sci-fi, and I love when sci-fi gets really weird and kind of ridiculous. So, you know, Rick and Morty is it Netflix? I feel like it's something that I don't have access to anyway. So, uh, oh, and he's written for Jimmy Kimmel Live, Onion, and yeah. You know, that does make a lot of sense. Some, yeah, the, the the comedic stuff here is really, really excellent. And you can tell that, yeah, you know, The Onion, they have a very ridiculous, very outrageous sense of humor sometimes. And that's very much visible in, in this movie. Now, yes, yeah, so, so according to interviews, the... You know, this is still very much about family, like the first two. And yes, I would definitely agree. And I think... Yeah, so I'm going to keep it spoiler-free, but I will say there are some... You know, as a progressive, I really love the politics of this. Like, the MCU has basically always had... Like, there's always been at least some progressive politics, though, you know, arguably the first two Iron Man movies are more, like, there's some there's some Ayn Rand going on, but recently they've really, they, they dive in more than, you know, or earlier they used to be more cautious with it, but yeah, there are a lot of progressive messages in this, and... Yeah, I, th I thought they did a great job communicating them, and it felt very natural. Like, there's there, there's at least one specific character who repeatedly argues for progressive causes, and, yeah, honestly, it's, it's not a spoiler to say, Cassie is a firebrand progressive, and absolutely love to see it. And yeah, it makes sense, you know, a lot of young people, um, there's a, there's a tendency for young people to lean more progressive, and we're especially seeing that today, you know, because, you know, so many such bad conservative policies have, you know, basically ruined everything, so yeah. It, it makes a ton of sense for, for Cassie to be a firebrand progressive. And I've seen a lot of American media where they make fun of the progressive. And, you know, there, for, for example, there's very frequently the, the kind of thing of, oh, well, you know, you're only progressive because you don't have, you know, you, you haven't had the problems that conservatives have to deal with. And if you were in a really bad spot, you would turn conservative, you know, I really appreciate that they didn't do that here, like, Cassie, the character might grow, but it's not about, oh, she needs to stop being progressive, so, yeah, quite appreciate that, um, yeah, all of the characters are written with their like, unique voice, like, there there are characters who don't even appear in very much of this, and I could still, like, I, f I feel like I could, I could describe them, and, and, like, ah, what's the word? Like, you get a, you get a sense of who they are through, like, what they, what they say, what they do, and, and, yeah. Um... I think that is about it for the writing now but but yeah Jeff Loveness did not write the first two Ant-Man movies he didn't write for them at all and he is the sole credited writer on this I believe now the direction is what I'll move on to Peyton Reed has directed all three of these, and he also directed two episodes of The Mandalorian, one of them featuring a an Ant-Man, which, yeah, that's, that's cute. 
And before he did a bunch of comedies, Yes Man, The Breakup, Down With Love. Huh. Gross Point. Is that... Does that have anything to do with Gross Point Blank? Anyway, Bring It On. He, he directed 13 episodes of The Weird Al Show. So that might also have helped with the with the weirdness here. The computer wore tennis shoes. I'm, I, I I forget if that's... I haven't watched that one, but I'm not sure if it's a comedy, but it is also sci-fi. And... Let's see... Um... Yeah, so... Right, so the there are a number of supporting characters in the first two movies that I don't think I want to give away if they just don't appear at all. I guess I'll try to make yeah. If you're you know, I'll I'll say that as one of the first things when I get to the. I'll really quickly note. Um, let's see. So mention which characters. From... Now, um, yeah. So the the um, Luis and. Is it bad that I don't even remember the names of the other two? The the Russian and TI I don't I don't remember their names. I watched the first two movies just a few days ago and I already forgot their names. Anyway, they were basically the the comic relief in the the first two, which I think it was Brad Jones or one of his friends pointed out it's already a comedy movie. You don't still need to have a comic, you know, there, some of the other MCU movies aren't really, they're not, um, they're not quite comedies, they just have at least one comic relief character, but the first two Ant-Man movies are essentially comedy heist movies. Anyway, yeah, this, I, uh, this one isn't really a heist, and the, the tone is very different. Um, they, there are new comic relief characters. And, yeah, so the first movie is kind of stiff. The second is a bit looser. Both of them are insubstantial. This one does also have the, the, it feels, it's, it's looser like the second one, but it... It does have more substance than the first two. And let's see. Yeah, so Ant-Man and the Wasp is a comedy sequel that just does a bigger version of the first movie. Since that one was an unexpected success, like with Deadpool, Guardians of the Galaxy. This is the first time we see the third film in a series where that happened with the second. So I was wondering if... This movie would do the same thing, second movie in a row, third movie in a row. It doesn't really. Like, there are references to the the jokes in the first two, but it's not, like, you know, let's be honest. The second, you know, the, the three series that I just mentioned, the second movie, they, they felt like, okay, we gotta bring every joke back, because people liked it, so... And, and this movie doesn't really do that. There, there are a couple of... Yeah, a couple of references. But by and large, they have new material here. Now, I have some critic quotes. It's much better than Phase 4. I mean, I'm, I still love Phase 4. I, I don't know. I think certainly a, a lot of people will like it better than they did Phase 4. 
um, I think it is as good as, as Phase 4. It does a great job setting up the future. The climax is epic. The movie is incredibly different from the other Ant-Man movies. Tonally, it is all over the place. For example, having Kang and Modoc in the same movie. And another critic point, you know, said Modoc is a character people will either love or hate. I really respect the person responsible for putting Kang in this movie, and I really respect the person who put Modoc in this movie. If this was like high school, I would you know, high five both of them. But if I was the teacher, I'd probably try to separate them from each other because boy, do they get each other into a lot of trouble. I loved both Kang and Modoc in this, as I kind of th figured I would. And, you know, yeah, in the comics, like, they're both, ri you know, they're, they're both out there, but Modoc is completely ridiculous. They, I, I don't think there's any way to play Modoc straight. And they realize that. They don't try to play him straight. Kang, under the right circumstances, if you if you do it right, if you approach it right, you can make him a bit more serious. And, like, you know, you, you might... You know, if you saw them in person, you might flee from both of them. But, like... Modoc, you'd have a difficult time not laughing as you're running. Whereas, like, Kang, the way they handle him in this movie, you'd probably be screaming while running away from him. They do a really solid job on him. I'll, I'll talk more about him when I get into the, the character section, but... Holy crap, they really absolutely nailed... Yeah. Yeah, various critics have said this feels like Star Wars. They say that's bad. I agree with the Star Wars thing. I do not agree that that's a bad thing. And let's see. Then the, yeah, another person says it's a redux of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 by way of Rick and Morty. I, I mean, certainly there's some Guardians Volume 2 going on. I don't know. It just didn't feel like, like, you know, I could, I could, I love Guardians 2. I, I could put it on, like, as soon as I stop recording this video. I just realized I did not already say I hit record as soon as I got home from the theater. But the... Yeah, I... I this isn't... In my opinion, this movie is not so similar to, to Guardians 2 that it just feels like a... the Just the same thing. I... Yeah, this this one, this is something that's going to bother a number of people, and I understand why. I'm, I'm not sure they're wrong. The problem with Quantumania is that it's not a movie, it's a building block. It is definitely very much building towards the, the next thing. And yeah, you know, when I was a teenager, I read comic books, so I love this kind of thing. I, I love you know, diving into one adventure, and then it, like, it also tells me what's, what's coming next, you know, but obviously, if you don't like that, or if you're just like, we've had 15 years, can they, can these people please just tell one story at a time, yeah, that's definitely gonna bother you, nothing, you know, yeah, I, I don't know if the, if Marvel is that, I feel like every so often they'll give us something that's really not trying to build towards something. But then the... Yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure... Was Thor Love and Thunder particularly interested in building towards... You know, I mean, sure, there's, there's the God stuff going on, sure. But by and large, that movie is like self-contained it's it's a thor movie it's not an mcu movie it's a it's a thor movie that was made by the mcu you know kind of thing but they yeah the mcu the the creatives are not interested in ceasing this kind of thing they're just every so often gonna give us a movie or two that you know that was also a thing like 
The first two Ant-Man movies didn't really build towards the next big thing. You know, I mean, they were basically palate cleansers, both of them. And, and you know, for sure, some stuff in them, may, you know, matters. But the, you know, the important stuff that Scott Lang did was in Endgame. It wasn't in one of his solo movies before now. Now, let's see. Right, so more critic quotes. Tonally, this film is different from the other films. A bit uneven, it feels like Jeff Loveness' script wasn't sure what genre this movie wanted to be. That's true, yeah. The first two Ant-Man films were straightforward with their comedy and pretty on the nose about it. Peyton Reed wants to make a Star Wars film, which is great for him because that's clearly where his ambitions lie, but it's bad for the Ant-Man franchise because the strengths of that series, its humor, its modesty, its small scale, humanity are missing. See, I... Yeah, I can't really argue with that. That's... Yeah. Now... See. Yeah, this person says, it's goofy, but goofy to just the right degree. I think that's, yeah, I very much agree with that. Now, let's see. Yeah, so the, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about the, the opening of the movie, but it's... You know, we, we very quickly get a an idea of where where it's going. And I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I like the ending. There's no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And this does have... It has a mid credit scene and a post credit scene... I heard some people were unhappy, like, you know, right after the, the post credit scene ended, you know, and the, the I think about at least a third of the, the people left the theater before the, the post credit scene, you know, but gradually more and more people are realizing, oh, we're going to miss stuff if we go home or, but... I did, you know, one person turned to his friend and said, I don't think that was worth waiting for. Which, to be fair, I noted down, it's like 12 minutes of end credits. So, not everybody are going to be, you know, if you're not super big on the MCU, maybe you're not going to care that much. But it is... I, I would argue it's an important scene. And... Yeah, I, I loved, I, well, I liked the post credit scene a lot. I love the mid credit scene. Make sure you do not miss that. Like, short of the theater being on fire, stay until you've, stay in your seat until you've seen the mid credit scene. And if it is on fire, just stop and, and wonder... How big of a fire is it? Like, is there a chance that I could sit and and take in the mid credit scene and then move before the fire gets to me? Okay, that's terrible advice. Anyway, that brings us to the character. So, Paul Rudd as Scott Lang slash Ant-Man. Now, the... Yeah, so, you know, in the first two movies, he's very much this, like, you know, he, he kind of, you know, other than, you know, he wants to be there for his daughter, and, you know, in the second one, the, the mother of his daughter and the, the new husband of her really really like him they don't so much in the first movie but other than that you know that's that's basically it now he's kind of a celebrity like he he wrote an autobiographical book titled look out for the little guy and 
see. Yeah, basically, you know, it's about, you know, the the events of Endgame. And, yeah, you know, he's it's, it's fun to see how, you know, basically now everybody loves him, you know, as, as you see in the trailer, even the, the, like, you know, he was fired pretty promptly from Baskin Robbins, but now they actually really love him there, and, yeah, it's, it's fun seeing him in this completely new, like, you know, they, they, they realized we can, we can, do something here there's there's room to, to to have some fun with the character show him in a way that we've never seen before you know in the first movie he literally just got out of jail and he you know agrees to steal the ant-man suit and then to you know yeah basically because he wants visitation and wait well uh, isn't that what it's called or is that a jail thing anyway he wants to see his kid you know and then in the in the second one, you know, he's under house arrest and he has to, you know, but now, like, everybody knows what he did during Endgame. Everybody is super, like, they're, they're so excited that, you know, he's around and, you know, there's, there's a scene early on where he goes into a, a store and they insist that he, he's going to get the, the food for free kind of thing, you know, and it's just... Yeah, it's it's nice to see, you know, because he is like, if anybody deserves for for everybody to recognize them in a positive way, it's Scott Lang. Like he's done a lot of good. He he really did, you know. Yeah. So so the. Yeah, it's fun to see him like that. Now, in the first two movies, he makes a lot of mistakes that leaves other people frustrated with him. That's not really a big thing anymore. Cassie is frustrated with him in this one for, you know, basically she, you know, she would call what he, you know, she would say he has become complacent. He would say that he's being careful to protect his loved ones, but, you know, that's the, yeah, you know, she's, she's young, so... She doesn't, she thinks she's invulnerable, basically, and they have some fun with that as well. Now, let's see, right, and Evangeline Lilly as Hope Van Dyne, or Wasp, and let's see... Evangeline Lilly said the film would explore how the character deals with her fragilities and vulnerabilities, considering from how Ant-Man and the Wasp showed how powerful and capable she was. Now, over the course of the first movie, Scott and Hope fall for each other, but then the second one, she's angry with them again. I was wondering if this would just let them be happy together, at least some. And yeah, there's there's definitely some of that, and this one doesn't... Yeah, I, I think... I don't know if it was Jeff Loveness or if it was a studio note or something, but someone watched the first two movies back to back and were like, we can't do this again. We gotta make the third one more distinct from the first one. So it's like, again, I love the first two movies as well, but it does kind of feel like, like I feel like the second movie is the dream I had after watching the first movie and, like, eating a lot of candy in the theater, you know, made my dreams kind of crazy and just, you know, it, it just, yeah. And with this one, they, they very much changed. They, they were more eager to, to go in a new, yeah. And Michael Douglas is back as Hank Pym. And part of the fun of these movies is that Hank is a better old man. So, yeah, I, I was hoping they wouldn't change that, and they, they don't. Like, there's there's a little bit where he's less, you know, and, and certainly it is, you know, he's not as frustrated with Scott 
as he, you know, in the first two, like, there's a lot of just him being angry with Scott because of the things that he, that, that Hank asks of Scott that Scott either doesn't do or doesn't do to Hank's liking. He's still a bitter old man, but it's for, for different stuff. And, and I did quite enjoy, like, apparently the other, the, the ant family, make fun of Scott for having written the the book and and like which is also like that's fair like saving the world that's great writing a book about it and everyone you know getting recognized by everyone okay take it down a notch now let's see and yes Michelle Pfeiffer plays Janet Van Dyne let's see and yeah, various critics have said, you know, she's a real standout. We get to know more about her. I really appreciate, like, it is, uh, you know, it's not a surprise that they couldn't really, you know, in the first movie, she hadn't even been cast yet. She, you know, they, they took, apparently took family pictures where she's like, her face is covered in, you know, the the rim of a hat or something, like, you know. In the second one, she's barely in it. This time, you know, she's in this movie from minute one. And I mean that literally. And we get to know, like, what happened. You know, 30 years in the quantum realm. Like, it's not just like, oh, you know, whatever. Like, I got to read a book because I had a lot of time on my head. No, no, no. Stuff happened. And she did not share it with the rest of us and when we find out you can 100 percent understand why she didn't so just yeah it, it, it was really great like you know pfeiffer incredibly talented actress uh, you know i i was uh, looking forward to you know the, the moment that we heard she was cast for the second movie i was looking forward to when she would get to, to act, and she does get to do a little bit in the, the second movie, but there's so little time, and it is fairly, like, you know, she shows concern for some, and she's maybe scared in a situation or two, and then she helps, and that's basically it. Here, she gets to be morally complex, and I'm not gonna claim that Everything is perfect about Batman Returns, but I do think that she did a phenomenal job. And that is the kind of, you know, you know, obviously not like beat for beat exact same performance, but it is that kind of thing here where like you can understand why things turned out the way they did. But you're also like, wow, that's not great. Um, okay, let's let's see if we can fix this, you know, kind of thing. So I really appreciate that. I, I've always, I love when a woman gets to be really complex and kind of, you know, the, there's not this thing of, oh, you know, if, if we show her doing something wrong, then people at home are going to think that women always do something, you know, there are some people who can't, uh, you know, there, for sure there are a number, of, a number of misogynists in the world that just don't comprehend that just because a female character does something wrong in a movie, you know, obviously it shouldn't be like all, you know, we don't need every single movie to have it, but I do think it is we we've had so many years so many movies where you have you know at least one prominent female character who basically doesn't do anything wrong like they're just you know everything about them is perfect and i think it's it's it is more interesting you know this is for as as far as you know feminist movie kind of thing goes this is perhaps closer to a birds of prey or a Jessica Jones, the the Netflix series, than something like a Wonder Woman. 
Now, Catherine Newton as Cassie Lang. And yeah, uh, Scott Lang's daughter who acquires a suit similar to her father's. The character was previously portrayed as a child by Abby Ryder Fortson in the first two movies. And I do, I do feel a little bit bad because she did do a really solid job. Like, you know, if you watch them, you know, she, she really nails it. She's, she's charming and, you know, you buy it when she's like scared and in danger and this kind of thing, you know, but yeah, they needed an aged up version. So yeah. And Emma Furman played the teenage version in Endgame. Now, director Peyton Reed said that he wanted to further develop the relationship between Cassie and Scott, as it was central to the previous Ant-Man films. He also added that since she's older, she has become a scientific mind in her own right. She's been going through Hank's, Hank Pym's old journals and notebooks and has really latched onto this idea of quantum science and quantum technology. So they are still putting the word quantum in front of everything now so yeah in the second movie cassie says she wants to be scott's partner and yeah you know there is some they they do have some fun with you know them potentially being partners in in this one now let's see yeah, and so the first two movies are about fathers taking care of daughters, doing heroic things to save them, and this definitely does still, you know, it is still very much about the relationship between Scott and Cassie, as well as the relationship between Hope, Janet, and Hank. Now, let's see... Yeah, uh, some critics say, you know, Catherine Newton is neither, she's not bad, but she's not amazing. Yeah, I, I think she did well. She did about as, as well as she could with the, you know, she's not necessarily given the very best material. You know, like, like I mentioned, I approve of the, the politics, though, but there are a couple of things where her character not given the best writing. Anyway... Jonathan Majors as Kang the Conqueror. And I don't know how much I want to give away because technically in this movie it is not revealed until a little bit into it. So I don't think I'll talk too much about... I'll just say that, you know, this is this is not the first time we've seen Jonathan Majors in the MCU. He does do a really, really great job. Like, these are very distinctly different and compelling versions. And... Let's see... Now, let's see. yeah, and and you know, various interviews. The you know, they're saying it's it's very exciting that the the you know King will be introduced to the the viewers, and I agree. I have some critic quotes about him. Let's see. Majors thankfully writes the ship every time he pops up with his deliciously disconcerting presence. This is undeniably Jonathan, the Jonathan Majors show. Did Marvel just find its next great villain? While it's not surprising that Marvel's imposing physicality perfectly suits his iconic villainous character, he also invests his performance with such an arrestingly quiet stillness and ambivalence that you're on the edge every moment he's on screen. It's very true. Like, you really don't know what to... Like, holy crap. The... Just... Yeah. So, so... Utterly unpredictable and, like... Just, yeah. Honestly, I would say if you... If you haven't made up your mind yet about whether or not you want to watch this, 
if the concept of a live action Kang, of, of Jonathan Majors playing Kang in a, you know, huge movie like this, I would say it's worth, like, just for him. I, he's, he might be the single best thing about the movie. And, yeah. And I really appreciate, like, at the start you get this brief, like, you, you meet him very, very briefly. And then it's a little while where people are basically, like, they're not, at first they're not even saying his name. They just, they're just like, he is looking for you, beware of him, you can't stop him, kind of thing. And then a little while later, people start saying his name, and you get a little bit more information, but like, they really knew that, they would, that it would be worth it. Like, honestly... I, I don't remember when the MCU last played this coy with such a major character. Because he, you know, it's not like he just shows up for five minutes at the end either. He is extremely important to this movie and he dominates the screen. But just, they really make sure to build to it. And the build-up makes it so much more effective. Like, just, holy crap. It, it just... Yeah, this is this is what we want out of a villain in a movie. Just yeah. And let's see. I think that is about what I'm going to So that's it for the characters. Yeah, I will I will very briefly say I think the you know, I, I mentioned Cassie is progressive. It feels like it was written by someone who actually you know, believes in the in the progressive causes. It doesn't feel like there's a there's this um I haven't watched the Big Bang theory, but I hear that a lot of the the jokes like if you're actually a fan of the things they they mention, then you'll know that they're getting a lot of these references wrong. And you know, I can imagine that must be frustrating for you know, nerds watching that show. And I don't mean to disparage anyone. I consider myself quite the nerd, but the you know it's nothing to be ashamed of. But the yeah, you know, this didn't feel like it was written by someone who just heard once that this is something progressives believe in. You know, it legitimately felt like you know the, there's an understanding of the things that just yeah and now that there's actually yeah there's a there's a part of the movie where Cassie seems to maybe not have, like, a humongous amount of respect for, like, cops. And, I mean, she did say in the in the first movie, she realized that her father was being, um, what's the word? Um, you know, the cops were trying to catch him, and she said, I hope you don't catch him. So, let's see, the, um, is that, so, so yeah, I guess that is just following up on that. So, that brings us to the cinematography. You guys, this movie, this movie was shot by Bill Pope. 
the legend. So, um, yeah. Matrix Trilogy, Spider-Man Trilogy, uh, the Raimi Spider-Man Trilogy, Shang-Chi, yeah. Um, is it completely unreasonable to ask that he shoot every comic book movie that comes out in the future? Yeah, that's probably, that's probably too much for for one man, even one as impeccable as as him, he does an incredible job. Like throughout this, like you really get the the scope of uh, which is extremely important because a lot of this movie is set in the quantum realm, which you know we've seen briefly before, sure, but we've never like camped there. And even though we did always talk about it, and now, yeah, we're, we're spending a lot of time there, and it is this, you know, it has to make an impression. If, like, this is a movie where if you, if you from early on kind of dis, um, disengage with the idea of the, of the quantum realm, if you look at it and you feel like, no, that's fake, it's, that's not real. There, th those people aren't actually there. They're just on green screens or something. The movie is going to completely fall apart for you. And they realized that they needed some... Yeah. Just... Let's see. And... The editing was handled by Adam Gerstel and Laura Jennings. Now, let's see... Adam Gerstel also edited two episodes of The Mandalorian. The 2019 Lion King, Transformers Last Night, Jungle Book, and some shorts. Uh, let's see, what episodes? In... The Marshal and the Rescue were the ones that... Right, yeah, yeah. Excellent editing on that one as well. And Laura Jennings, other than this, um, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, Morgan, Edge of Tomorrow, and a number of shorts and TV. So, yeah. The... Yeah, you can you can tell that you know Edge of Tomorrow also has this action the, these action scenes where basically if the if the editing is not very very tight then you're just going to you're not going to be able to follow what's going on. And yeah, it was it was very smart to to bring her on board for this. And yeah, she does a a really great job. There are a couple of parts where the editing, you know, the movie opens, or pretty much opens, one of the first scenes has this, it's, yeah, it's basically a montage, and, you know, Scott is going around, and we're seeing how people react to him now, and the way that, yeah, you know, so... The, the, they knew that they had to get a lot of, you know, we're, we're also told, like, apparently, you know, Hope took control of the company, and she's, like, doing amazing science that saves the world through, you know, yeah, scientific means, which is, of course, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that, like, someone got across to the, the, you know, some of the people working on this. We literally spend the, the entire first two movies, like, they don't really acknowledge, for example, that 
the the uh, shrinking and growing technology could completely change the world like you know food and shipping and these very just yeah and it is also this kind of thing of like you know obviously at least one of them needs to be a scientist in order for us to get to the whole shrinking growing thing but once you have a scientist who has like their own company and this you know the first movie kind of sidestepped this because he wasn't in charge of the company anymore but and and you know the second one they're on the run but now yeah they they, they needed to to acknowledge that and they do so yeah i quite appreciate this is also like gradually over the course of the mcu like at first you had to like put on a suit and then like i guess was it maybe around did civil war maybe have one of the things where like the at least where the helmet could disappear and reappear without like you you don't have to take it off your head anymore and yeah by now like the entire suit can basically just be invin invi yeah invisible so you know when you decide you want it just you know it appears around your your clothes and yeah the the movie is in a hurry in a number of ways and yeah now that brings us so this uh hold on does it Hmm. I guess it's not. Okay. And... Yeah, there's some really great, like... The, the, some of the sets are, are very, very memorable, like... You know, once you're in the quantum realm, like, basically, it's a world very different from our own. Uh, you know, it's it's essentially a parallel, or not parallel, but a, another universe, almost. Another, another world under ours. And, yeah, like, the, the, you know, there are multiple gags where something will be established to be basically the opposite of what things are like in our world so yeah they they you know it wouldn't make sense if things just look the same because you know there is a part like relatively early on they go to a bar and there's like there's a bartender there are drinks and there's just it wouldn't make sense for it to just look like one of our bars. So, yeah, they make sure to make it different enough. And and not in a, like, illogical... It doesn't just feel like, oh, you know, whatever. Because there is a logic to it. It's just a logic we're not used to. The action is really great. So, we have chases, there is, you know, physical fighting, there, there's shooting, you know, um, let's see, I don't really want to give too much away, but just, yeah, there's, there's some really great action, and it, it does... Like, every, yeah, every major type of action that, you know, so there are flying vehicles, for example. So, of course, sometimes, you know, the, the flying, you know, maybe there's something to fly, to, to fly quickly away from or race towards and those kinds of things. Now... The music, 
let's see, is handled by Christoph Beck. And let's see, yeah, so also did Jazam Fury of the Gods. And Hawkeye, WandaVision, uh, let's see, Frozen 2, there's, did I copy in everything? I might have copied in everything, there's a bunch, very prolific composer. And, yeah, you know, really good score. It captures the weirdness without feeling, like, w when it comes to music, you have to be very careful about how weird you make it because it needs to, like, you know, un unless you are just going way out there. But at the end of the day, they do hope that this movie has a certain mainstream appeal, you know, it's not for nothing that the start of the movie basically very quickly sums up the events of certainly the first, I think maybe also the second solo movie and, and you know, end game. Like, basically, they, they really want you to be able to... And, and yeah, you sort of can. I, I would argue that you can sit down and watch this without having watched anything else MCU. Like... For sure, there's, like, there's a couple of things where you're going to be like, what was that about? But, yeah, you can basically follow it. So, anyway, the score, it's it needs to be weird in a way that communicates to the audience, this is weird, and this is the type of weird that it is, without being so weird that we're just like, wow, that that doesn't work at all, kind of thing, so... And, yeah, it, it does a good job. The sound design is excellent. Like, we're dealing with a lot of stuff in this movie that doesn't make any sound in reality. A lot of it doesn't even exist in reality. And, yeah, they do a really great job. Like, every everything feels like it has... Like, it, it makes noise the way that you would... That... that just, yeah, it, it feels like it's really there, and, yeah. Now, that brings us... So, yeah, the, the pacing is a tad uneven, and, yeah, parts of this movie are very much... Like, I, I wouldn't say that it's in too much of a rush. It's not, like, rushing to the point where you're, like, you know, it's it's... No, the the scenes work. It's not rushing through them to the point where they don't, but you can tell that it has to get a lot. You know, there there are things that it basically has to. You know, what what happened since Endgame, and what about the things that were left a certain way at the end of Ant Man and the Wasp? And, you know, weren't really, you know, in, in Endgame, we weren't told what happened with that since. And some of that stuff isn't brought up in, in this movie. But some of it is, and, and they have to very quickly address. Now, right, so if you don't count the end credits, the movie is an hour and 50 minutes, and... With end credits, it's two hours and two minutes. And... Let's see... So yeah, the, the best element is definitely Kang. And... Yeah. You know, I already mentioned it's worth watching at least once in 3D to experience just for that. Now... Yeah, the worst aspect is probably the fact that it is very much in a hurry to, to set up future stuff. And the worst thing, you know, ultimately, I don't think it's a big deal, but, you know, it, it is it is basically down to either you're 
really on board for the MCU or, you know, obviously if you're like, okay, I'll watch one more MCU thing, but that's it. This is not that MCU film. Don't watch this if you're, if you're trying to wean yourself off. And if you, you know, if you don't particularly like the, this whole thing of continued story, which again, I completely respect. It's not, you know, I love it. But that's, you know, part of that is also that I've been very happy with the movies. If I started really hating the movies, I would probably be, I, I wouldn't still be happy that they were making so many, un unless it was making enough other people happy. But anyway, I get being, being frustrated with that. That also, you know, this is not, yeah, a movie for you for that reason. Now, yeah, so... The so, something I saw various critics say was was really bad was the the tonal inconsistency and yeah for for sure like um if that's something that's going that that bothers you personally then this might it it might really bother you here I I mean I if if there was something in this movie that felt completely alien to, you know, like there there are characters in this movie that are that I haven't that I don't recall reading about in the comics, but they all fit inside the the comic, you know, the the MCU, so you know, yeah, I'm I'm down for that, but yeah, if you're not already on board, that is for sure something that's going to yeah. Now so yeah, I, the thing I was most looking forward to was more Ant Family stuff, and yeah, I was very happy with what there was, and yeah, um, the trailers do give at least a little too much away, you know, I, I try not to be that guy, but there were times in this movie where... I guess it was only really, yeah, near, near the end of this movie. I was like, well, I know it can't be over yet because they haven't had this thing, which was in the trailer and looked super cool. So, of course, you know, I it's been like a couple of weeks since I last watched the trailer. But they, you know, I, I intended to, to re-watch the trailers earlier today before watching the movie, but time got away from me I, I i need to go into the the quantum realm evidently but yeah the the you know at the same time it does also give you a really good idea the the trailers communicate well what the movie is like and let's see cover and poster um, yeah, you, you can check out cover and poster and such and get a good idea of what the movie's like without it spoiling, and yeah, so Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 53 critic rating, uh, I, are there, I, I guess it's the second... MCU movie to be, I feel like, didn't they also, the, the, the um, uh, what's it called, um, huh, yeah, Eternals was also rotten, and other than that, the movies, have been fresh or even certified fresh. There's a little bit of... Yeah, season one of Iron Fist is also rotten, and so is Marvel's Inhumans. But yeah, um... I, you know, I said it of Eternals, I don't think that deserves to be rotten. I don't think this movie 
this movie either deserves to be rotten, but it is that thing of, you know, at the end of the day, um, Rotten Tomatoes is binary. They, they gauge as either positive or negative, or, or as either, in, either a yes or a no. I think the sugar high is starting to come down. Um, and that's not as, um, yeah, you know, of the 155 reviews, 82 are fresh and 73 are rotten. And the average rating is 5.80 out of 10. And, yeah, the, the thing that, you know, I, I, um, I read the ones that were out before the... Yeah, I guess it was all 155. I, I think the the n not the entire reviews, but the the what's it called the um, summary of of each review and you know and I've used some of them as, as critic quotes early in this video. A lot of the negative ones, a lot of the down votes were like critics basically saying if we approach it as like media criticism then this makes some important mistakes and you know it's it's not like if you ask the the individual critics was this fun to watch they might not say you know uh, 53 out of 100 but yeah and and it is there there are definitely some issues with this i i wouldn't give it that low of a of a rating but you know certainly if you you know if you hold this up against like all other movies instead of you know it's it's not really a grade on a curve situation i don't think so yeah and on metacritic it has a 49 out of 100 Based on 46 critics, 15 positive, 23 mixed, and 8 negative. And on IMDB, it has a 6.6 .6 based on 1,824 IMDB users. Although right now it is slightly questionable because 29.4% gave it 10 out of 10 and 12.8 percent gave it one out of 10 both of those are in my opinion uh, you know extra that's that i would not go that far at, at all but yeah you know it's um I don't, I, I, I haven't heard of, like, I, I don't know if this has been review bombed or, or, you know, or there, are, or someone is planning to review bomb it or anything. Um, but, but yeah, it is that thing of, you know, you can't necessarily trust, sadly. And, yeah, so the special effects... They're, they're very, very good. I don't think there's ever a time in this where I was, like, distracted by something not quite looking real, which, you know, unfortunately, the, you know, Disney pushes the, the special effects people too hard. And, you know, I... They very well may have on this as well, but in in this case, it did, you know, the the effects did come out looking good at least. The the yeah, there really needs to be better, you know, better workers' rights for special effects people. But but yeah. If we're looking at, you know, there, there are some really great designs and everything feels like it has a weight and a mass. And there are some scenes where it is like, holy crap, how did they even, like, 
it's it's kind of insane how much you know how many different elements there are working together and just yeah they they did an incredible job there's some really solid stunt work and that so the yeah my my rating is eight microscopic adventures out of ten and oh right I've yeah I was supposed to go through this list at the you know yeah basically at the at the start of this video but yeah so I have I have a list where I've ranked let's see I've ranked everything except I I haven't yet ranked I'm I'm buying myself a little time to rank yeah yeah I um yeah so the every MCU movie Worst to best, keeping in mind I love all of them, they're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. Iron Man 2, The Dark World, Black Widow, Captain America 1, Thor 1, Ragnarok, Hulk, Ant-Man 1, Ant-Man 2, Love and Thunder, Homecoming, Doctor Strange, Iron Man 3, Iron Man 1, The Avengers, Age of Ultron, Ant-Man 3, Doctor Strange 2, Far From Home, No Way Home, Guardians of the Galaxy, Holiday Special, Volume 1, Volume 2, Black Panther, The Winter 1, The Winter Soldier, Werewolf, Shang-Chi, Eternals, Wakanda Forever, Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame. And I'm just going to make sure I copy. There we go. Now, that brings us to the thoughts sections. So... For the rest of the video, I will be spoiling this movie. Now, starting with the section, notes taken while watching. So, yeah, in case you, you skipped to here, the... the um, Wikipedia says that... Um, Kurt does appear in this. I gotta say, it's not impossible that he did, and then I must just have missed him, but he certainly isn't much of this. This doesn't... It doesn't feature... Um, I forget how they pronounce it. Lewis? They don't... Um, I, uh, I forget what T.I.'s character... I'll find real quick... Um, Dave. It also does not feature... It's, yeah, I'll just go through them. Sonny Birch, Maggie, Paxton. D Jimmy Woo is very briefly in it, but only to, to tell us, you know, just very, very briefly, just to tell us, uh, you know, he is friends with Scott now. And I guess that is right. And and yeah, um, Ghost is not in it, and Doctor Bill Foster is not in it. But if you were hoping to see, um, Corey Stoll as Darren. I can't believe I'm blanking on his last name. Um, yeah, he does appear in this. So, from here on out, spoilers, uh, you know. If you watch more of this video, you will get spoilers. On, you know, I'll, I'll be spoiling stuff you don't want to know before watching. So, 
Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that the movie addresses how important communication and media are and their their role in societal change. Near the end, we see that, you know, basically the, the big thing that was necessary, the, the thing that allows the... I'm just going to be calling them the rebels. I, I'm not sure they are given a name in this, but the, the rebels in this movie, they needed... The, the, you know, Kang has created a, a dictatorship. He is the only person who can communicate out to, you know, who can send a message like that out to every... Or wait, or is it just... Yeah, the, yeah, the fact that it is... Hmm... Yeah, it's it's possible that there are other people who have a lot. Yeah, yeah, no, I I feel like that's got to be it. And and certainly, you know, they were able to to say, you know, Cassie. I I did quite like that. You know, at first she she thinks that oh the you know sure I'll I'll make sure that what was her name um. Oh, right, I got it. Uh, I have it right here. Because it's a very specific name. Her name is Gentora. Katie M. O'Brien plays Gentora. You know, at first, Cassie's like, oh, yeah, sure, we'll we'll get to the tower. Gentora's gonna send out a message. And then Gentora's like, okay, I'll hold them off. You deliver a message, you know. So it's, which is like, yeah, you know, that's, um... Cassie wasn't expecting to to be the the you know to be delivering this message, but it is you know if if you are able to communicate effectively as you know as a progressive, it is very beneficial to do so. You know, basically the entire revolution happens. You know, like the the thing that sends them over the edge is this message you know they're they're able to deliver the message and they say we're inside the tower he is you know he's not invulnerable he can be beaten which you know that wouldn't have the same effect if we met um if we met kang like five minutes in and then he's just in the rest of the movie you know what it, it wouldn't have the same effect but because we specifically you know the movie starts and like you know at the at the very start you know we see janet in the the quantum realm and a king arrives you know and then it's like maybe 20 minutes before the next time someone like mention you know are you here with him he is coming for you that that kind of thing and like is in the review a little later, people start saying his name. People are terrified of him. And, you know, once you see him, you know, when, when he's like, oh, I can't believe they broke my machine. You know, he goes down and he, you know, yeah, just holy crap, he's, he's effective against, uh, you know, yeah. I, um, I don't know if they were uncomfortable with the de-aging, but... Like the the according to the second movie, Janet has been in the the quantum realm since what was it like eighty nine or something like that? You know, we we saw like a nuke. Be oh wait, no, was that was that all the way back in the sixties? Yeah, I'm not one hundred percent certain and anyway she's been there for a while and when hope saw her before the she disappeared in the quantum realm she looked the way that yeah if i had to guess i'd say like late 80s or early 90s based on what you know she she looked you know yeah, the, the de-aging in the second movie, she looked the way that she did in 
um, Batman Returns, you know, age-wise. I mean, here it seemed like they didn't really de-age her, or at least not very much. I mean, I, I thought that the idea was that the, the, or wait, was she, was most of the time she spent in the Quantum Realm uneventful? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, that seemed a little off to me. Now, let's see. Yeah, um, so apparently Cassie, I, I quite like, you know, Lang is sitting there reading the, uh, uh, Scott is sitting there reading his book. And, and the, the, you know, there's always room to grow. Wow. I mean, he is a dad, so he's, it's, it comes with the territory. That is, that is a dad joke right there. But yeah, the, the, and I like, you know, later we find out, oh, he listens to his audiobook in the car. And, you know, he's like, and, and I think, yeah, Cassie's like, turn it off, turn it up. And it's just, wow, he is, he is very much a dad in in the uh, yeah but yeah the the um, you know he's like oh why is why is jail calling and uh, you know yeah cassie was and and one of the cops is like i knew you have it give it back and just like they did a really great job because it did he he legitimately sounds like she stole his toy at the sandbox or something like and you know finally she's like oh hey here it is, and she like she shrunk the police car. <laughs> That's that is that is very funny and very satisfying. You know, I I haven't personally had bad run-ins with the police, but you know, I do watch, you know, news and yeah, American police are terrible. So yeah, that was that was very satisfying seeing, and and it is like. You know, Scott doesn't have that much of a, like, come on, dude, you, you know, you, you broke out of jail multiple times. And, and Hank does also say, I, you know, I was just going to send the, what was it, uh, the, the ants to break her out. <laughs> now, let's see. And I like that nobody, like, Scott is the only ant family member to care that Cassie went to jail, like the other ones, the, you know, Hope, Janet, and Hank are all, like, fine with it. Now, and... I appreciate the, you know, once Janet unplugs the Quantum Realm satellite, the, um, you know, she, she does it basically immediately but it's still not quite fast enough because the you know Kang wants them you know he wants the the help of someone who has access to the the pim particles and um let's see what was the word I, right i appreciate the detail that like cassie you know is sucked into the the portal and once that happens then scott you know lets himself be sucked in because he doesn't he's not going to abandon her and i think was maybe hope goes in after um after after janet is sucked in so that's some great and you know basically like when scott and and cassie reunite like you can tell they were terrified that they were gonna lose years together again and you know or maybe never see the other person again now yes a, a lot of great character moments you know, Cassie says, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. I, uh, I'm i used to taking care of myself or something like that, you know. And, like, Scott, 
like is is hurt and and she's like i didn't mean it like that you know she she wasn't trying to make him feel bad because she knows that he didn't want to miss all those years she's trying to assert herself and say you know i yeah you know i have experience i know what i'm doing you know and i do also like it, i 100 percent buy that like she went to hank and was like so shrinking and he was like shrinking 100 percent let's let's do this thing you know and this thing of like look i i'm very careful with the suit and he's like you have a suit you know just it's such a great because yeah and and then once they're in the quantum realm you know she she activates the suit and uh, yeah and janet cuts off a guy's arm for a ride but it grows back the the arm not the ride and Scott drinks the ooze and understands the words spoken, which, like, I I like that that's... Because, you know, the, the um, in the Guardians movies, that's space. Apparently, Peter has, like, a... In, what's it called? Like, a universal translator installed... Or, I, I forget, or chip, that's it. A universal translator chip kind of thing. But that's space. This is quantum, so let's get weird with it. Sure, he has to drink the liquid of a guy who doesn't have holes, and that's why he has this thing that you can... That's, yeah. Honestly, if I had... A, a nickel for every time my teenage daughter told me drink the ooze then I would go to therapy I I quite like the I, I believe the actor is called like La Lakeith um, I'll just see if is it not Lakeith uh, hmm. Oh, hold on. I might be... No, never mind. It's William Jackson Harper. The... the. Um... Yeah. You know, the, the telepath, I quite liked the... Yeah. <laughs> the thing of... How many holes do you have? Seven holes. Oh, so you know? No, no, I'm a, I'm a telepath. And then you know, stop thinking that. Stop thinking that. Stop thinking that. Look, you know what? You look weird to me. Okay. Just. And... Is that building alive? Yours are dead. I mean, when you put it that way, I guess it is sad, huh? And, yeah, we're told that Kang sent MODOK. And at first they don't say MODOK. They say... Hold on, I can... I, uh... Let's see, did I... Maybe have it here. Um, let's see. Yep. Hmm. Okay, I'll f I'll find it real quick. And there we go, Modoc. The mechanized organized organism designed only for killing, and you know Scott points out it sh that should. That actually spells Modok, not Modok, which I I quite like. I I was sitting there thinking, you know, they they say all the words, and I was like, well, 
It's a nappy mode off. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah. I quite like the fight in the the club. I think they do a good job here of using, in the action, there's the shrink and growing, but you also have this alien tech and such. And, yeah, so apparently in order to fly, at least some craft in the, in the quantum realm, you have to stick your hands like you know like like stuffing a turkey and it just yeah and and you know at first he's like oh i can't believe i'm about to do this and then later he's like i'll drive and just just yeah that was and i i really appreciate the the sound design there because they really did like you know if you just see him reaching in his arm because obviously there's not actually something there certainly there's nothing that's making those disgusting sounding sloshing noises but no, you know, it's okay, I guess we're we're going to fly this plane. So, you know, just, yeah, horrifying sounding. Just, yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm sure the, the it's, it's probably for the, the younger and less mature in the audience, but I enjoyed it too. And... Right, I, I like Cassie saying, telling Scott, just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean that it isn't happening. A very progressive message indeed. Oh, I just noticed your baby legs. You look like a Bjorn. <laughs> he does. And he no longer answers to the name Darren. I did like, you know, when he's like near the, the core, he's like, Darren, Darren. Modoc. And immediately Modoc responds. That's, yeah. I'm really, really glad they brought Corey Stoll back. I, um. Is it possible to have Corey Stoll in every movie from now on? Because just. He's just, he's so much fun. And... Let's see... Yeah, very effective when um, Janet is explaining about Kang and, you know, she touched the, the, the ship and saw that he's, you know, going around killing all these people. And Kang says the time is a cage. It finds a way to break it, it break us all, something like that. And Yeah, we're we're told, you know, he didn't crash, he was exiled, and can understand why. And just, you know, right at, like, he's literally just met Scott. You know, he's, he's down there wondering, did I, if you're an Avenger, have I killed you before? I've killed so many Avengers, I can't keep track of all of them. He means to torture Scott by killing Cassie and having him re- relive the memory or, or keep seeing it happen over and over until you know he begs him to to kill him as well and this is how he says hello you know this is literally the first like this is not after like scott didn't like insult him or something you know he walks up to scott and is like I'm sorry. Do you do you just have one of those, one of those? Maybe you just have one of those faces. But did I kill you before? Because I just I I I feel like you know just when I when I look at you, I'm just like I think I killed that guy, and so I there's something that I need you to do for me. If you don't do it, I will murder your only child in front of you and force you to relive that memory 
forever until you eventually beg me to kill you. Like this, just, holy crap, this guy's intense. And, and it is, you know, a very logical, yeah, uh, Janet embiggened the, the core and, yeah, pin particles are necessary to shrink it. And, yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a clever way to, to have him trapped in the quantum realm and have Scott be the, the key to, yeah. Now, right, and then we have the the many Scots, which, uh, yeah, it's a it's a fun scene, and I could definitely see. Okay, yeah, this this is from a this is from a Rick and Morty writer, isn't it? And amongst the many Scots is a Baskin Robbins Scott, and the others are like, wow. What are you wearing? I, mean, I work at Baskin Robbins. This is the uniform. What are you guys wearing? You know. And I love. I, I don't. I don't know who came up with this, but I love that right after he says, "I work at Baskin Robbins." Like within a couple of seconds, you just hear this distant voice of one of the Scots go, "Do you have ice cream?" <laughs> You know, and then all the chaos erupts. So, you know, but I really appreciate that. Because, like, you know, a lot of the Scots are, are still, like, either they're like, oh, what is happening? Why are there so many of us? Or they're like, we got to stay on target, you know. But at least one of them is going to be like, I mean, I could go for some ice cream. It's, you know, just... And I appreciate that, you know, once they hear Cassie, all of the Scots, you know, every Scot wants to help Cassie. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, you know, Kang explains he knows that the multi -ver multiverse would die if his variants were, you know, allowed to, to do what they want. So, so yeah, I guess this, that means that this is Kang Prime, isn't it? Now, that... Um, oh, right, yeah, we're, you know, we find out the, the ant farm with the high IQ, you know, that was this, um, what's it called, um, the, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't recall, but I feel like that's, you know, basically... You know, it's, it's hard to, to think of something much more diminutive than ants, but here we go. You know, ants have are, are super intelligent. They, they end up saving the day at the end of the movie. You know, if the ants hadn't come in there at the end, then they wouldn't have been able to stop Kang. And, yeah, I, I feel like that's got to be saying, you know, yeah, I know you've probably been told that... You know, this or that ethnic minority or this and that, you know, gender identity, you know, that they aren't capable of this, that and the other thing, you know, but here you go. They, they, you know, they might be. Yeah. And Cassie calls to arms the revolution and... Yeah, I like when Scott goes huge and fights King's forces. And, you know, a bunch of the the jets shoot at him, which really reminded me of that part in the first Avengers where all the aliens shoot at Hulk. And... 
yeah, I, I love that we get to see so much of the revolution. That was something that I, I felt more, you know, um, Ragnarok should have showed more of. I really like the, you know, the, the goo ooze guy. You know, like, he's the, you know, yeah, he, he basically runs directly into enemy fire. And, like, you know, they, they stop shooting for a little bit. And he's, you know, and then he, you know, he's, he's completely okay. And he attacks and he goes, I have holes. <laughs> and, yeah, Cassie defeats Modok and tells him it's never too late to stop being a dick. Which I really appreciate. And honestly, that probably is... I, I don't always have as much patience with misogynists and such as, you know, every so often I'll see, you know, fellow progressives say that we really need to be very patient with them. And yeah, it is true. I, um, yeah, it's something I need to work on. Now... Uh, let's see. Yeah, once once the the core has been destroyed, then Kang attacks personally. I really appreciate. Again, you know, it really is like he does not actually engage in an action scene in the present until the end of the movie. Like we get a little bit in flashback, and the the you know uh, Janet sees it when she touches the the ship. But, you know, it's only here at the end of the movie that we get it in the in the present. And, yeah, uh, you know, he was just waiting for it to, to be ready. So he, you know, he doesn't care what happens to the, you know, he, he's going to travel to, to Earth. Or, you know, he's going he's gonna to leave the, the quantum realm. As soon as the the machine is ready but once it's been destroyed you know there's absolutely no reason for him to to stay up there and it's also you know he can unleash his fury and i do gotta say there's a lot of times in this movie where one of the good guys escapes during a perp walk like Let's see. So, so there's the part where, yeah, we have a we have one here near the end with with Janet. You know, there's at least one with. Is it maybe Cassie who gets? Yeah, there's at least two. I think there might be three or more, and that's just like, yeah, that's. You know, it would have been great if there was a little bit more variety to that. Now... Yeah, I really like seeing Kang fighting good guys using ant powers. And... Yeah, the massive ants stop Kang. And... You know, Darren helps stop Kang and, yeah, says it's never too late to stop being a dick. And then what on earth did I write? Oh, right, right. Yeah, I wrote. Yeah, the... Um... Right, the... the... Um, yeah, I gotta see her name again. So, Gentora is very much coded indigenous, and yeah, absolutely love to see it. You know, indigenous people are some of the ones who fight the hardest against dictators and, you know, colonizers and such. So, yeah. I, I really appreciate that it's not just another white guy 
that's, uh, you know, yeah. And... Yeah, I like the, the fight between Scott and Kang. You know, near the very end, I, I will say I did kind of get the sense, you know, that was something where near the end I was like, I mean, in the trailer we saw Scott and Kang fighting, you know, to where Scott got, like, hurt and such, so it must still be, you know. And... Yeah, and and King shrinks, and they escape the quantum realm, and there's some voiceover, but Scott also, um, you know, yeah, he's he's a a little worried about some, or more than a little worried, but yeah, he's worried that things you know, are going to go really badly, and, you know, obviously that is also, you know, we the audience are supposed to leave the theater thinking, you know, there's going to be more Kang kind of thing, and it, it was kind of funny with the, you know, I made this cake myself, and he opens it and is like, you don't say, how much, how much money for you to burn that thing and for us to never speak of this again. And, you know, he, it's just, yeah. It's, it's, I know it's not, you know, happy for fake birthday. I missed a lot of your birthdays. I want to make up for it, you know. Oh my god, you know, just... <laughs> like, bad cake. Yeah. That was, Yeah. And we get the mid credit scene, which I loved. I loved seeing the Council of Kings. And we're, you know, we, we find out that they are, they will target Scott and presumably Avengers. Just absolutely epic. I love seeing so many variants. I love that they're, like, I've seen, you know, like, the, there, are, there are YouTubers who will, you know, Use a, a panel or two of the the Council of Kings in from the comics. I don't remember them looking particularly different. It was basically just a bunch of them that looked largely the same. And then here we have these very distinctly, you know. But and and I do appreciate here. I forget which I I don't re remember what the individual ones are called. But one of the ones we see here in the mid credit scene is the one who was like a pharaoh, and that is one of the the most famous comic kings. And if I recall, he was actually retconned, I mean conned, into being a king, because originally it wasn't supposed to be a king at all. But yeah. And the But but yeah, it was it was very cool. And like there's a, a couple that you get a very good look at, like all the way to the edge, I want to say, let's see, my right, your left, whatever, kind of, th you know, and, and I think one of them is, like, barking or howling, and it's like, okay, that's very intense, and very, like, just, and, like, there's a, there's a manic energy to him, like, he's, he, he can't wait to, to go out and start attacking these people who are, poking at the multiverse and yeah like from their point of view you know from a from a certain point of view it really is like holy crap like yeah um it's not it's not hard to understand why they really really want for us to or us for the for the the various avengers that have affected the multiverse you know, to to get, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, you know, very likely one of the things was the, um, the events of Loki season one, which, yeah, I can, I can understand, you know, so, so yeah, there's that, there's the Doctor Strange, you know, both, yeah, both the third Spider-Man and the second Doctor Strange solo movie, 
and now this. So yeah, it's you can you can understand why they yeah. And yeah, so the post credits we see Loki and Mobius having found a Kang, which yeah, you know it's I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more of the yeah and that brings us to the final section entitled notes taken before watching and oh right yes yeah. the only thing that Okay, yeah, honestly, I'm just gonna, there we go. Yeah, um, yeah, the only thing I actually had written was, I really do hope the rumor is true that Corey Stoll is now MODOK because he's so much fun to watch in Ant-Man 1 as Yellow Jacket. And, yeah, I, I think they did a great job, and I think it was a good choice that he has, like, this, I, I guess, like, a mask or, like, shield kind of thing covering his face a lot of the time. And just, yeah, you know, based on what we saw in the first Ant-Man, I can believe that he... Because, like, parts of him were shrinking. You know, like, it was it was an uneven kind of... It wasn't, like, the whole thing shrinking, you know, the, the way that... You know, and that was part of... That was how they were showing us that there's something wrong here. It's not supposed to be that way kind of thing, you know. So, yeah, the idea that he's got little baby legs and arms, which was also, like, what was, was it, was it Scott that he was, like, she, you know, he, he did something, touched his face in some way with the little baby arms and baby hands and the giant head. That was just, yeah. Now, um, yeah, that is absolutely everything. So... Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what are your hopes for the future of Kang or the past of Kang with him. It's pretty much the same. Seriously, though, what do you hope to see Jonathan Majors do next time we encounter in, in Kang Town? And yes, so if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And recently these videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog. We'll just catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time.